recorder. Hey everybody, Breakthrough Health and Life Coach Glenn Haddam here. I'm here with my good friend, David Pasico. Can you say hi to everybody there? Hey everybody. Okay, that's how we roll here. That's how we do our mic checks. Uh, David is someone uh, that I think you're going to, if you really uh, tune in, got a pen and a uh, pad of paper, you're going to have some really great notes to reflect on today's conversation. Today's conversation, uh, and David's, David's share that I'm really eager to, uh, to bring to this audience is, is just one of, uh, one of humility, one of um, uh, a tenacity. You know, David, someone that I really respect in his field of work, though he's branched into a few different uh, new uh, directions that are very relative to his uh, recent experiences. Uh, I believe you're. I believe you're in for a really fun ride today, mm-hmm. uh, which um, life, you know, brings us. You know, life's a ro- roller coaster. We get hit with stuff that we didn't anticipate, and it takes us in a new direction. And we have to listen, and we have to bring a resilience, a patience, a um, uh, surprisingly an abundance mindset to situations that don't feel ab- full of abundance at the moment. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I do, I'm just bringing all this eager anticipation of, well, what's this about? <laughs> uh, well, Dave, maybe share a little bit about what you're up, up to in the world these days. And sure, then, sure. and then we can kind of rewind a little bit to figure out how you, how you got here. Cause you and I cross paths. Uh, I'm going to say, gosh, has it been, has it been a decade now? How long has no, it been? I don't, I don't Not that long. So. No, maybe yeah. about Five, six years, I think, Glenn. Five, six years, five, six years. Yeah, it really feels like decades now. Five, six yeah. years. And uh, I went to you for uh, some really deep piercing work uh, around also you were engaging with uh, life alignment work, which we can talk about a little bit today too as well. Um, but Dave, someone that uh, you're someone that I really um, appreciate, there's probably, I'd say several hundred at least of my clients have have these phrases stuck in their head like don't beat the willing horse and and uh, I can go on and on with all the all the uh, key Sorry. words that you've helped me with anchoring in and embodying uh, something uh, that I need to stabilize within myself and and that's um, maybe running counterintuitive to the um, operating system that I, that was in play and mm-hmm. so when I usually meet with people in my own coaching practice there are often times to seed seed these things that will help people uh, start to evoke a dormant part of themselves uh, an awareness and and uh, evoke an awakening of aspects of themselves that they're they're maybe often at times when I meet with them are not quite ready yet to step into but it's time to seed those things and mm-hmm. so I've, I've learned that uh that attribute through you powerfully um and um it's been very potent in my life the way you've stepped in fiercely um courageously and again like in a very potent way that i could i could hear things and receive things from you Um, the transference of that wisdom um, so it could start to work its magic so to speak Mm -hmm. within me and within my own context so beautiful um so to start with like life happens and um there's a there's a jewish expression that man plans and god laughs and so at the age of 13, I planned to be a dentist. My best friend's father was a dentist and I knew I needed to be something. So that's what I chose. I went through four years of undergraduate work um, in pre-dent, which was the same as pre-med. And my grades weren't like top of the class, but good enough. But when I made that decision at 13, I didn't realize that if you're gonna be a dentist, you have to have manual dexterity, and I don't have that. And so I got thrown with this dental aptitude test where you had to do spatial relations and, and uh, carve soap, and I just bombed. And I did it again, and 
I bombed a little well, a little, little war, you know, like not as bad, but I applied to 12 dental schools and got refused by all 10, by all 12. And when I got the last refused, my mother said, you must be so disappointed. And I said, I was actually relieved because what I really wanted to do was be a teacher as, or a social worker. And I've done social work kind of work because you know the whole psychotherapy that I was doing before when we met um, and coaching uh, was kind of scratching that itch. And then I was a teacher in the Detroit public schools. I went on to um, help found a residential school for troubled teens in Southern Ontario, Canada, um, back in the early seventies. And I learned a lot there in terms of um, just working with people, having understanding and I started off as a teacher and then became the executive director. I helped found the school. And so at a young age, I was 29 when I became director of this $1.3 million operation back in the early 70s. And it just catapulted me into a different level of maturity that um, I've grown to appreciate. But I was reflecting on my journey yesterday because you mentioned life alignment. It's a it's system of energy healing. We can get into it. This is kind of like a teaser where you've got all these different aspects into the body. I, I've used it as, as a way of doing something that's body-centered to help people get unstuck. But yesterday, I'm, I'm on this, the executive committee of this international organization. There's, we teach this in 18 countries. And I had to facilitate a very difficult meeting yesterday, um, which could have had an explosive impact or could have been healing. And it went well, and I reflected afterwards that I've actually been perfectly um, tutored by life to get the skill set that I have. And so you make lemons in a lemonade. I got refused by all those dental schools. <coughs> and then wound up being a teacher, which wound up helping me meet my friend, Jeff Levine, who developed this work, he's South African. What were the chances of the two of us meeting in rural Ontario in the middle of nowhere? But he heard of the school and came for a visit and we needed an architect and it went from there. But just to draw the thing together, life's challenges, can either help you rise to the occasion or it can set you back. <coughs> right after we met, I had a very active coaching practice in Boulder, um, working full time at a wonderful office, was newly married. And I was teaching and the year before I taught 15 classes in the life alignment work, I had a medical doctor in Santa Monica who had invited me to come to Santa Monica and join her practice and work with her, some of her A-list celebrities. And I said, I'm not gonna do that, but I'll come out once a month. And so that year I was in California 10 times, that's 10 weekends, teaching 15 weekends. and running my practice. I also was doing some corporate training work in Silicon Valley, um, mostly at Intuit, the software company. And so all of the things that I've done along the way just opened the doors for me to branch into these, these things. And then Susan was here in Michigan. I was in Colorado and I was cleaning a furnace filter, fell. And if your audience knows anything about anatomy, it's not easy to injure your quadricep tendon, and it's not easy to do both. And I did both. And so I found myself on the floor. I hit my head on the countertop. I knew I was bleeding. I couldn't, I couldn't use my legs. I had the presence of mind to check and make sure that I felt I was okay uh, cognitively, because that was my biggest concern was a head injury. I was fine. I called her, I told her I fell. 20 minutes later, my friend Steve was there. 
I had my first ambulance ride, had my first overnight stay in a hospital, had my first surgery, and then wound up two months in a rehab facility. And I, I sat in the, re I was like, you know, they had to use a hoist to get me out of the bed initially. It took about six weeks before I was in any kind of shape to even try to get into a wheelchair. And it was humbling because I'm a caregiver. And it was, you know, I, I, you know I, I couldn't take care of my basic needs myself. And um, people treated me with respect and I treated them with respect. And I put a sign, I had my wife put a sign on the door that um, I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't taking visitors. I let my friends in, but I took all my meals inside and I treated it like a silent retreat. And I just used it as a way of visualizing myself healing. And, um, and so I, I read Joe Dispenza's book, um, You Are the Placebo. Yep, that's a good one. And I used that as a template. And I, many times a day, affirm that my left ankle, because I, I, I broke my left ankle, sprained my right. My left ankle is strong, my right ankle is strong, my left knee is strong, my right knee is strong. And that I move into this next cycle of my life with, with thankfulness and a sense of adventure and gratitude for what is. And that was sort of like, my guiding light. And um, I also used a pain management device we can talk about. And the surgeon said I wasn't gonna be able to stand until at least six to say eight weeks after the surgery. I knew I could do it after four. I got his permission to try. So I stood up after four weeks. I walked the next day 25 steps. And I walked out of rehab after eight weeks. When I left, um, the, head of re the, the head of physical therapy said that in all the years, I was in her top 10 list of remarkable recoveries. But I used it as a means to just regroup and see what was going to be next. And what was next was it was obvious that I couldn't have my clients wait for me to heal. I had maybe 25% of my clients were couples. I couldn't rest their marriages falling apart. So I referred them to colleagues, shut my practice down. And then we moved here to Michigan to help look after Susan's ailing mother. And then we put down roots here. So it's, it's like just seeing the guidance that happens when you actually pay attention. And guidance to be told I wasn't going to be a dentist and do what really was my calling, um, which led to a lot of synchronistic events and positioned me to have the skill set to do what I did yesterday. And, um, and so that's kind of a little bit of a thumbnail sketch as to part of my journey and the influences in it. Oh, it's, it's uh, I, I know painful going through this, but so rich with, um, <laughs> you've got your plan. <laughs> Just right. like, you know, dentist school is like, sorry, these fingers aren't doing that. Right. <laughs> like, no way. No way. Like you can't sell any of these schools on it. Like they're like, nah, no, nah, that's a, that's a, that's a zero. And, uh, and here you are at a different turning point in life where you've got this really well-established, like practice that you're impacting people's lives and there's a line out the door of like need you for this week's next session and it's like i'm so used to serving others and i need to like i need to pull all that giving that mm -hmm. giving and now really learn to give to myself like i gotta heal myself no one's coming to save me i've got to heal myself i gotta i gotta be the best student for the technology that's being offered to me to heal myself and and you know, it's kind of like that, what's that book? Uh, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's just like, well, can't get fed here anymore. Right. And I don't even know what's out there, Right. but that's where I'm going. Yeah. And 
And it's what, funny, Glenn. And, and I just come to mind, so I'll pitch this in. When I fell, I was lying on the floor. I fell the first time and ruptured my left quadricep tendon. And I got myself on a chair and I had the presence of mind to check myself. And then I, my, I saw my leg swelling up, so I went to get ice. So I stood up on my, on my good leg and I didn't know that if you rupture your quadricep tendon, you can't stand on that leg. So I stood on what was my uh, uh, disabled leg, fell again. And in the fall, I ruptured the, the second quadricep tendon and hit my head. And I, I did the inventory and then I just started to laugh because I knew that this was such a freak accident, that there was a greater wisdom at play than hmm. my um, mind with my five-year plan was, was, going to, was going to author. And I just yielded to whatever that wisdom was. And I knew that I could trust it. A long time ago, I heard a phrase of Einstein's that's just been part of my whole fabric of being. And the quote is this, he was asked, what Einstein thought the most important question one person could ask another person, what would that question be? And his response was, do we live in a friendly universe? In other words, is it dog eat dog, survival of the fittest, um, random acts of violence, and he who dies with the most toys wins, or is the universe conspiring to support you? Do we live in a friendly universe? And I, I've chosen to operate that the universe is conspiring to support me and that I can partner with life. And so I need to show up as the best possible partner that I can be to this unfolding, you could call it providence, you could call it grace, you could call it spirit, you could call it life, you could call it God, whatever that is, I'm not religious. But just this organizing context that you know keeps the geese migrating and keeps the seasons flowing. And you know, I cut my hand as a kid and I got six stitches and you know, I didn't try to heal that, those cells. My body knew how to do that. There's a wisdom here. And so I just learned to yield to the wisdom. And there's another person I met along the way. So it was my first visit to Colorado back in the early, in the mid seventies. I was taking a spiritual leadership class. And there was an old guy there who was adjunct faculty. He was in his 80s, he was, he shook a little, but you could see the man that he was. And he turned out to, his name was George Shears. He, he started off his career as a pitcher for the Yankees. They called him Scissors Shears. And Scissors Shears. And he was a pitcher and he got injured and his career got cut short. And the injury was a back injury and he became a patient of one of the first chiropractors and became a chiropractor. And this guy lived his life on seven words. And I spent as much time with him as I could because I wanted what he had. He, he, he was plugged into something. And the seven words are thankful for all things under all circumstances. So as I've had real challenging times in my life. Like when my first wife got diagnosed with breast cancer at 40. Uh, thankfully, she's still with us. Um, it's just the marriage died before we did. But when we got the news, doctor called, got the news. The first thing that flashed into my head was thankful for all things under all circumstances. And I said to her, I don't know if you're going to survive this or not, 
but I pledge to you, I will give you all the support that I can and we'll use this to advantage. And we don't have to look at this as a death sentence. So it's kind of like, is the universe current conspiring to support us through this? And when you approach things with thankful for all things under all circumstances, your first flush of feeling is openness and wonder and not damn it and awfulizing. And then from that first flush of feeling, you then have something of a foundation to find your way through the maze. Like I fell, I had it in my business, I had to leave my friends. Um, the community that I built over 25 years in Boulder. And um, and I I haven't looked back. I've I had a I had two hours in I had two hours in the car today doing some some stuff and I spent the time calling old friends. So I you know I still stay in touch with people. It's just that we're not able, you know, to go to the hungry toad for a beer after work like we used to. So that's that's kind of another couple of pieces. Is the universe conspiring to support me? And can I be thankful for all things under all circumstances? And then and then the magic can work. Because you're showing up and because I, I show up then in partnership with life with a sense of wonder of how this is going to unfold, you know, including this interview. So, you know, I don't know how this is going to go. I just centered myself before the call and here we are. You know, I think of centering, you know, it took me through a lot of um, reaching out, seeking, seeking elders or other uh, professionals uh, for unanswered questions and then turning inward on my unique journey of self-discovery and <clears throat> medicine journeys and a variety of different tools to arrive at this place, the centered place of the, you know, some call it the seat of the soul, a, a place where um, the I am that animates Glenn and Glenness and um, this identity that's so been heavily stacked upon. Mm -hmm. um, one I, and often, you know, you can, I, I've arrived there when I've done sweat lodges and different activities where um, the fire that I've, Put myself in and forged uh i've forged a portal to a place before um this concoction this uh this vessel um starts to tell the world the rules of how i engage with it the limiting filtering system and so when i uh spend time sitting in the observation tower uh mm -hmm. there's a availability at openness and, and everything comes down to the activities I'm engaging with in life are here to help me show up, to show up um, in my purest, cleanest form. And mm -hmm. from that space, I'm good. I'm not, nothing can, nothing can harm me. Mm -hmm. there, there, yes, there's many deaths and rebirths that are going on, but, uh, Everything exists, the past, the present, the future, everything all uh, coalesce in this one space of everything's as it should be. Not to tolerate it is very different, but to, and not to just accept it, but I love the, you know, saying loving, you know, lovingly accept what is, meaning like I'm co creating this, I'm part of this. This is supposed to go down this way. And what to be revealed from what's going on well that's a little bit mysterious at the moment and can i hang out in the mystery of life uh, i don't know what your experience has been but for me that's been um how i've um constantly found myself arriving back at this place of um not just safety and security uh, and it's a destabilizing place of reality of like, okay, I'm in the soup and here are all the ingredients. And I, I, it would behoove me to relax 
to breathe, to focus on the basics, mm -hmm. to allow what's happening, because what's happening is happening anyways. So mm -hmm. just allowing going into my head and trying to eject myself from the present moment unfolding, is, is that serving me? Is it serving others? Um, so yeah, my, I guess finding that way to a place of presence. So when you were experiencing these, what would one might say while going through it, it's a pretty horrific experience, uh, but it's before we label it horrific, before we let something to simplify it. Because when we act like we know whether something's good or bad and label that, we are cutting ourselves off from all other possibilities. And we're no longer able to learn in our knowing, set knowing, we can't be learning and growing and expanding. Mm -hmm. And so how can we uh, release ourselves from the automization of simplifying things so we can kind of parcel away things that are discomforting. Yet in this probably most discomforting time in your life, it's it's uh, seated one of the most expansive times, which I'm excited to hear more about how that's how that's been unfolding for you. But that's my yeah. experience. Beautiful, Glenn. You know, when you're talking, a, a story came to mind. I wrote about it on my website as a blog. This whole thing about not reacting and presence and being centered. I have a good friend in Denver who's who was a sniper in the Vietnam War. And that explains why he was walking by himself in the jungle. And he, he was ultra aware of his surroundings. And there was a brown log across the path. And as he approached it, it wasn't a log, it was a king cobra. And a king cobra can be like 18 feet long. And a third of it can stand up. And so now he's within striking distance of this King Cobra eye to eye. And he had the reflexes of a, of a marksman. He could have destroyed the Cobra. The Cobra could have destroyed him. One Cobra bite can kill 30 people yep. and can kill, can kill an elephant a king cobra bite and he just stood his ground the cobra stood his ground or her ground and he just broke eye contact and just retreated backwards and when he told me the story he had a sense of reverence for the and respect. And in today's highly charged, highly toxic world of communication and accusation, blame, criticism, which I call the ABCs of ineffective communication, he could have got into the best defense as an offense, but he had the presence of mind and the presence of heart and the presence of centering to just discern what he should do. And it was to retreat. And no one got hurt. So it it's, you know, can we be that internally poised when challenged to be able to discern the right course of action. You know, you know when people ask, I, I've asked this question to hundreds of people probably. And the question is, how do you make decisions? And most people say, well, I just think it through, which means they're, they're doing it mentally. Right. It's like having an internal spreadsheet of pros and cons, and I weigh the pros and cons, and I'm, I make a decision. A few people will say, I just feel it out, which means they're going into their heart. Right. Does it make me feel anxious? Does it make me feel happy? 
a smaller percentage of people say, I check my gut, which when I try the idea down for size, do I feel butterflies in a good way in my stomach or do I feel nauseous? And then a smaller percentage of people say, I go into a place of stillness and I try to access my higher self or my invisible support team or my guidance and discern what course of action I should take. And for me, when I'm on my game, and I'm not always on my game, but when I'm on my game, I do all four. I do the internal spreadsheet. It's got to make sense materially. I check my feelings. I check my instincts. And then I check my guidance as well and just see if it lines up. And if it lines up, then I got a pretty clear direction as to what I need to do. Hmm. And that, that's really what was operational when I had to make the decision to close my practice in Boulder. Because, you know, I always said, as long as I've got my mind and I can get my mind to the office with my mindset, but life had something different in mind. And it took bringing me literally to my knees for me to be able to, to um, stop and listen and, and then take the direction to make a different course. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's like this is it holotropic being able to connect all these intelligences uh, within ourselves to make these critical decisions that are very confronting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it, as I heard the story of the cobra, I remember being in a monastery in Thailand and a woman there uh, who ran the property, um, Swan Milk International Monastery. Um, mm -hmm she shared a similar story of coming into the, coming into the bathroom. She's telling this to all of us, mm -hmm. uh, coming into the bathroom and there was a cobra there in the bathroom by the toilet and it stood up and they had a conversation. She had dropped into her heart space, into a stillness, and they had a conversation between the two of them, her and the snake. It says, I see why you're here and you know why I'm here. And mm -hmm. I'm going to let you be a cobra and I'm going to let myself be, be me and I'm going to back up and I'm going to walk out of here and let you have the bathroom for now, but I'll need this bathroom later. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was very childlike quality, very playful and very um, the spirited, you know, way of like initially going to protection or, you know, it's a, are we going to war? <laughs> you know, um and how can we how can we in our society which is very reactive these days and there's a lot of toxicity of course that's prevalent but how can we pause how can we feel into all this intelligence within you know beyond the superficial reactions to like, you know, uh, you know, it's almost like your C-3PO and you've like, well, let me access all the stats here, all the odds here with all this data here. How can I make discern and make a uh, good decision for myself and everyone involved? Yeah, I, you know, I also want to say that I'm not saying that there may not be times when one needs to be very, put up a very clear boundary, speak their truth, or even take actions to protect themselves and their family. I'm not saying that at all. Um, in this meeting yesterday, this uh, woman criticized me for um, not being a strong enough advocate for, for a particular project. And I said, you have no idea what I did behind the scenes. And Please do not confuse kindness with weakness. Right. And so I can be a warrior when I need to be. Um, I just choose to um, have my modus of be more coming from my heart as opposed to being aggressive. Yeah. 
And you're definitely someone who showed me that and expressed that over and over when I, I had definitely had very difficult time with boundaries with expressing, I could give everybody else space for their boundaries, but I was just like, Oh, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And, uh, um, but the impact, like, I'm going to get throat cancer if I don't speak my truth, you know, like I'm being, I'm showing up and <laughs> inauthentic as all hell right now because, uh, I'm saying yes, when it's really a hell freaking no going on in my body and okay. learning to, you're one of the, uh, folks that had, um, helped emphasize that when I couldn't see that I was, how I was doing that, how I was, how I was, uh, showing up without um you know speaking my full truth and uh that that was harmful not just to me but to them as well too um because you know not owning that i'm a dangerous person uh is uh, is is dangerous <laughs> is not not owning your power and and you know, bringing that for me it was bringing that healthy masculine uh energy uh to that container um, I was, um, I was more malleable than, uh, than what would be serving, mm -hmm. serving best for myself and, and, uh, the person that I was engaging with those challenges at the time. So. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I've seen is when we don't put boundaries up, we teach people how to, if we that they can run over us and then it just reinforces bad behavior on their part but then so it sends a message to them as to their behavior you know if you were to ask me to boil down effective communication into one sentence here it is make it safe to tell the truth and make it safe to ask for what you need so if you're thirsty, I can give you a drink with a fire hose. It's not so easy for me to deliver it, not so easy for you to receive it. I can blast you, but I can also graciously serve you a cup, pour a cup and serve you the water. Easier for me to deliver it, easier for you to receive it. Mm -hmm. So it's about, it's about finding a way to make it safe to speak your truth. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think a lot of us are accustomed to either, you know, it's either fire hose or deep thirst. <laughs> yeah. right. And 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 that there's actually a middle ground, uh, a ground that actually works for you. Uh that um and I think all of us have to go through, you know, different aspects of our life of maturing to a a, way, a place of being able to articulate um our needs, you know, mm -hmm. and make healthy mature requests of those mm -hmm. things uh and when they're not met either you know removing ourselves or learning how to give those things to ourselves as well as that's also a practice uh, of being able to provide our own glass of water to ourselves you know in fact that's probably where we need to start is figuring out how how we mm -hmm. uniquely um receive things and then communicating that to the world in a way that um the world kind of matches up and aligns where you're at and you're, you know, you're what you're learning so far about yourself and, and the world. And, uh, it takes a lot of, uh, practice and reinforcement, uh, at least for me with like boundaries seem to have been a period, uh, of my life where I'm like, gosh, I need this on like a whiteboard. This is I feel very unskillful at this. I'm really good at, uh teaching and providing this for others but when it came to myself it was like wow i'm like really viscerally disconnected you know or like i've i've found a way to subdue that um good to see that you're on the other side of that yeah 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 well done good job <laughs> that's, a, yeah. that's a lot of work and it, it, yeah and every you know all these things that we you know the wisdom that you you've come into that you impart to others has been you know hard earned wisdom, you know, like, you know, you get, you get a lot to meditate all those weeks in the hospital there to arrive at, uh, 
some new, very loud, obvious conclusions. Right. You, have, you have enough very loud evidence to support uh, your viewpoint now and your maturity. And otherwise, maybe, you know, years back, you want to go and kick in screaming into like, I got to figure out a way to keep the practice going. And right. And, right? Like, right. You're like squeezing on, holding on to cotton candy for dear life. So it's like, the difference between making something happen and letting something happen. Right. Because, you know, there, there were times that I white knuckled how to pay the bills and what do I need to do? And, and um, just, you know, the struggles that we all have. And then when you, when I shifted into trusting that I could follow the guidance, and that there was support for me, then, like I said at the beginning, I just learned to play my part as effectively as I could in partnership with life. Yeah, I found that, I found that too, Dave, you know, where, I don't know, I, for a significant period of my adulthood, I fought the good fight. And I like, you know, I went at life like a Navy SEAL of like, like, we're going to win, uh, going to make this happen, um, going to put forth effort and relentlessness right. and perseverance, overcome the obstacles. And it, it reached a point where you know, it wasn't just people around me going like, are you getting exhausted yet from all that? <laughs> and uh, but there was a it was like this obvious experience of clenching and right. clenching and then finally and i got done a lot of this clenching uh to surrender and it doesn't mean give up no but it's like letting go you know it's like that and i used to hear it on the radio all the time when this process was going on but it was like that song hold on loosely you know but still like right. and yeah. it was like you know, it was just like how can i be more loose with life um trust life do my part my best with life and then trust the rest like and then life will meet you halfway so to speak or even two-thirds the way but you got to get off off the couch you got to do your part you have to take action you have to change your you got to get a reframe on what you're being confronted with maybe a uh, time for a principle shift or a philosophy upgrade but there's, I, I was used to accustomed to a lot of behavioral modification. Okay, I, someone points this thing out, personal development junkie me was like, I'm gonna go to work on that. I'm gonna fix that thing about myself, that thing I don't like. And what was really wanted was me to like go, hey, I'm all shades of a rainbow. I need to like, I need to love all the colors of me, the grays, the, like that's, that's the way, that's the path. The path is through acceptance versus um, if I'm going to reject aspects of myself, well, then the world's going to reject aspects of myself. In fact, it's going to bring in all these people and experiences to just confirm that I'm still not taking ownership of these disowned parts of myself that are wanting to be reintegrated. And so I know that's been my, my dance with uh, uh, discerning between putting forth immense effort only to discover um, I've got to trust life. I got to trust my body. This, this vehicle has all this wisdom stored in here. And if I'm just up here stuck in my little mini computer piece of it, um, I'm really going to miss life, what it's trying to teach me and share with me. Um, remind me of, <clears throat> of a couple of things. I had the privilege, I guess 15 years ago in Denver, I was spending about 10 minutes one-on-one -on -one with Wayne Dyer. And I was able to thank him because one of his early books changed my life. And I, you know, you're looking at, we were talking earlier about mentors before the call and um, he was one that I trusted his wisdom and went through a lot of his material. 
But the book that I thanked him about was called, You'll See It When You Believe It. Not I'll believe it when I see it, but you'll see it when you believe it. And it goes back to this thing about partnering with life. You know, a lot of us may have seen the movie, The Secret. And in the movie, The Secret, you know, you visualize the new car and you put your hands out and you visualize yourself in the car and then boom, the car comes to you. And it's an oversimplification. And I think it does a disservice because I try to visualize the car, but I never get the car. And what Wayne Dyer said in that book was, if you want a performance sports car and all you've got is a jalopy, that's all, you know, it's old school, a beater. And, um, but you take that beater and you tune the engine and you detail the interior and you change the oil and you, you, <coughs> you just take what you got and you give it what it needs. You learn the building blocks to be able to handle the performance sports car because you've built the skills to be able to receive it. And, and so, this whole thing around visualization is important coupled with action. I can't, like you say, I can't sit on the couch and expect to make six figures because I visualize making six figures. I've got to go do the hard work. Well, it's like Michael Jordan, you know, he visualized that ball going through the net, but he took a bazillion shots. (laughs) That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah. And a lot of misses. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hmm. Well, how would how would uh, folks get a hold of you these days? What's what's a good good way to connect with you? And 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 then also just tell us a little bit about a couple of the uh, projects that you're involved with these days. Um, because uh, there's there's a lot of fire in you these days. And I don't know, can you read that? says pasakov.com Pasakov. yes p-a-s like sam yeah. i-k-o-v dot com yep yeah they can see that so that's that's my website my phone number is there my email address is there yeah and um i'm happy to um connect with any of your viewers that want to connect yeah um so I'm not here to hawk a bunch of stuff, but there's a couple of things that I found that might be useful to people. So let's one hear is, your passion projects. Yeah, let's hear about them. Yeah. So one is this product called EHT. A little hard to read. Can you pull the little closer? Yeah. Maybe the camera, maybe it'll show up there. Yeah, I'll just write it down. So it's, can you read that? Mm, there you go. Just the lighting, the glare. Okay. Yeah, so it's EHT is the name of the product. And I'm going to distribute it for EHT. EHT. And it's it's based on 25 years of research from a f- microbiologist at Stanford U- at Princeton University called Jeffrey Stock. And he was looking for what to do to improve to improve brain function holistically. And he took enough, he knew enough about the neuron that there's a protein in the neuron that governs the cell called PP2A. And he needed to find what would would nourish the PP2A. And he found, after testing it with a bunch of stuff for years, that coffee did it. But you'd have to drink 14 cups of coffee a day in order to get the benefits of one of those pills. And so he... He took the caffeine out and isolated that it was this, this molecule, which is the long chemical name that comes down to EHT. And what it does is if you, if you visualize two neurons, they don't bind together like this. Right. There's a gap called a synapse mm-hmm. and then there's neurotransmitters like epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin that go from one cell to the other. But if one of those cells tangles, 
loses its shape, that neural network dies. Right. And as we get older, that can happen. And I'm 73 now, but I've been on this project for like five years now. And I'm as cognitively sharp as I was 30 years ago. And so I know some people suffer from that. And what this, scientifically what it does is it activates the PP2A and the PP2A keeps the neurons from sagging. There's an internal structure that the PP2A does. Like when one of the symptoms of, of, of dementia and in extreme Alzheimer's is the, the neurons lose their shape. And there's a bundle of, I'm not going into too much detail, but I'm a science teacher by training and I like this stuff. Yeah, that's fascinating. There's, there's a bundle of microtubules inside the neuron mm -hmm. that feeds the neuron nutrients, but it acts as an internal structure. And there's a protein called tau <coughs> that is like railroad ties. It, it just keeps those, those microtubules together. In Alzheimer's, there's a pooling of the tau because it loses its position. And by activating the PP2A, it keeps the tower in position, keeps the neurons in shape, and keeps the brain functioning. <coughs> so that's, that's how that works. And you have to get that through a distributor. I'm a distributor. Okay. And they can read up on the website a little bit about it. You have a page specifically for this or not yet? No, but if they got, if they got in touch with me, I can send them to another website. Okay, we'll great. Look at that. And then... There's this device um, called the Avacen, A-V-A-C-E-N. And it saved my bacon in rehab because it's a class two medical device that's geared to um, addressing inflammation and speeding up. Um, and in, in the process, it sped up healing. So the way it works, uh, this again was another research project. This was out, this was out of Stanford. Mm -hmm. This research team at Stanford was given the task of finding a way to prevent the tennis team and the football team from getting heat stroke. And so they went, well, if you put your hand in a bucket of water, that'll cool the body because you cool the blood, you cool the body. And there's a pool of, of there's a network of, of blood vessels in our hands and in our feet that act as thermostats. So you're hot at night, you throw your foot outside the covers, you cool off pretty quickly. That's how that works. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to cool, your, cool, the, cool the body, you could cool the hand. It's not as easy to put a foot in the machine. And so they, they did that, but they had to find a way to hack the brain to allow that to happen because if you put your hand in a bucket of cold water, the brain says, hypothalamus says, he's landed in a cold lake, he's gonna get hypothermia. And so the blood vessels constrict mm. to, to stop us from getting too cold. Likewise, if we're in a hot tub, it does the same thing. <clears throat> so they had to figure a way to cool the blood <laughs> without triggering that constriction. And they found that the secret sauce was putting the hand <coughs> in something that made a vacuum. And so that worked. And then about two months later, this guy, Tom, who de developed this machine, was reading an article about a research study that was being done in Florida on the thyroid. And this doctor gave his patients T3 hormones, mm -hmm. which raised the core body temperature and a number of the women in the study who were having severe migraines reported that their migraines were going away. That got his attention because his sister-in-law suffered badly from migraines. So he went to the team leader and said, can I reverse this and heat the body? And they said, sure, and sign this and sign this and you can do it. So he got the green light to do that, created a prototype of this device took it over to his sister-in-law. She was ashen gray, no appetite, 
<coughs> in a darkened room where she spent like one week a, a month total on huge pain medicines, medications from her oncologist doctor husband. They put her hand in the machine. She went from gray to pink. And they said, how are you feeling? And she said, I'm kind of hungry. And then she turned to her husband and said, I don't think I need my pain meds tonight. And so they raised $6 million from friends and family and did the research to, to develop this. And, wow. um, and then um, got the FDA approval as a class two medical device. So I had a buddy in Boulder who turned me on to it. I caught the vision of it, again, because of my science background, and I became a distributor. And, um, and then three weeks later, I fell. And after I got past the opioids for the first five, seven days, I refused all pain meds, not even Tylenol. And I just did this pain device several times a day. And what it does is when you open up the blood vessels, mm -hmm. you're opening up the microvascular system, which is 70% of our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And at a lot, at, after the age of 40, about 80% of us, our blood gets thicker and it doesn't as efficiently get to the deeper cells. When you open up the, when you heat the body, it opens up the blood cells. And not so much opening up the blood cells, blood is like, motor oil or molasses or honey. It's got a viscosity, it's not like water. Right. And so when you heat blood, you thin it. And so by heating the core body temperature one degree, that warmer blood goes deeper into the tissues to oxygenate and give nutrients deeper to the cells and take away toxins more efficiently. And so it just brought and it goes to wherever the inflammation is. And it just sped up my healing process. And, you know, the other feedback I got as I was leaving was the physician's assistant that I was working with said that I was one of the top 10 recoveries ever she's seen at that facility. And, you know, at the time I was diabetic on high blood pressure medication. I was on like six medications at one point. Um, and I've, you know, in rehab, I lost some weight, but by using the machine, my, my A1C dropped. And I, I've got a relationship with the, the inventor. We're, you know, we're authorized to say as distributors that it's FDA cleared for muscle spasm, muscle um, cramps, um, temporary relief of arthritis pain. Um, in the UK and in Canada, we can also say that it helps the microcirculatory system and fibromyalgia, but the FDA clearance doesn't give that here. Yeah. Um, but anecdotally, I can say my own experience, which was I was losing weight. I've dropped 50 pounds. I was losing weight as a diabetic because it was lowering my blood sugar levels. And I said to the inventor, how does that happen? He says, it removes toxins and it also can remove excess glucose. So I can't say that this is a treatment for diabetes. And um, what I can say is that because I was able to lose the weight and I, I'd done low carb diets, I'd done low carb diets and exercise I'd lose some weight, I'd put it back on again. This time I was able to lose the weight and keep it off. And by losing the weight and doing a no carb diet or low carb diet and exercising and continuing to use the machine, um, I'm now off my high blood pressure medication and I'm now off my diabetes medication. And the other stuff I was taking for digestive system and all that, I'm off of that stuff too. Mm. So. Um, I feel I feel I feel better than I have in decades, and so athletes are using this as well to help release the lactic acid, lactic acid and recover from workouts faster too. And so again, if people want to go 
contact me through uh, passacov.com, P like Peter, A like A, S like Sam, I K O V dot com, passacov.com. Then I can send them a link to my distributorship on the machine as well. Great, great. All right, thank you, David, on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it sounds like a very powerful, uh, I mean, very powerful tool. I guess, are they using it at the clinic where you were at now? <laughs> um, I'm no longer at that clinic, but we, we through my business partner in this, <clears throat> we sent a machine over to China. And through our contact in China, it was very well connected. He took it over to a nursing home in China. A nursing home in China's got like 5,000 people. Yeah. And they did a study with 25 people and 21 of the 25 people uh, had a positive effect with the machine. It, they reduced their pain medications, um, their pain levels were reduced. One elderly gentleman who wasn't walking started to walk again. And so they replicated the study at another nursing home with uh, 30 patients and they had the same percentage of results. So we're just now working with the inventor to see if we can open up the Asian market. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, again, it's all about service, right? I mean, I've mentioned these things because, you know, if you don't have your health, you're in trouble. If you don't have your brain, it's limited. And if you're, if you're dealing with chronic illness and chronic pain, which I, which I was with the arthritis and certainly was with the injury, it, it was just difficult to, to always be in pain. And now that's shifted, thankfully for me. And I do take an injection for the arthritis once a month. That's the only medication that I'm on now. But I feel, I feel stronger and more resilient than I have in decades. And these are a couple of things that I do that really help me. Now, I'd like to give one plug for one more tool that has, brings a lot of resilience to one's life, which is the uh, life alignment uh, work. Um, I think I've, got, I think I've got one of the books right here. This one looks familiar. That's the book. That's the book. So, mm -hmm. hey, folks, highly recommend this book. Uh, what would you say? What would be your one-minute commercial on this? I know we uh, <laughs> probably wrap up today, but uh, what would be your one-minute commercial on life alignment work? Because uh, it's a big part of. I'll just, I'll, I'll just tell you a quick story. Just take a, take a couple of minutes. When I was in Boulder, I had a super athlete as a client, and he would run up and down Long's Peak. And he did it one day in the springtime and slipped on the ice and started tumbling down a glacier. And he knew that if he didn't break his fall, he would uh, fall 500 feet. And so he directed himself to a boulder, hit the boulder, broke his leg. And he like put his elbow through the crust of the a glacier, scooped out some snow and just one bump with the time got himself off the mountain. This was one o'clock in the afternoon. There wasn't anybody else there. And he got to his truck at one o'clock in the morning, frostbitten, and drove himself to Estes Park for the hospital. He saw me to do trauma release, release on that. It took us five or six sessions to go through each one of those scenes that he described to me. And so we, we did this work called Life Alignment, which works at the physical level, the emotional level, the mental level, the spiritual level, using hands-on energy work through very specific gateways. Um, my friend Jeff Levine, who I met at the School for Troubled Teens in Canada that I talked about earlier, has discerned this whole system is channeled. He's attuned enough that he got this download. And like I said, we teach this in 18 countries. I'm the US coordinator for it. Um, that and four bucks could get you a latte in, in, in Boulder. I'm not bragging, it's just part of my service. But it's a very effective tool that I use to help people release 
limiting beliefs. And on page 95 of that book is a model that I created that I shared with the author, Philip. She asked if I had a contribution. And the model is this. We have experiences, experiences, experiences teach ourselves about life, about other people. So we draw conclusions based on our experiences. Those conclusions can get rooted into a belief system. So we have beliefs. Our beliefs can draw experiences to us that reinforce the beliefs. And then we, we, have, we have expectations and the expectations can draw experience. We keep on going through the same revolving patterns, same girlfriends, same bosses, same challenges. And what we love to do in this work is go back to the experience, rethink the conclusions that can lead to new beliefs, that can lead to new expectations, that can break the chain and free the person up for a whole new level of experience. So that's it in a nutshell. And I don't have to ask, why would someone want to do that? I'm like, <laughs> maybe you don't want to date the same girlfriend. <laughs> exactly. Or have the same boss. Have the same boss again, yeah. And, and I know that uh, for myself, yeah, I haven't experienced um, those dormant pieces of unresolved, you know, that reside in us. Uh, yeah, we, we <coughs> cycle through these patterns. They come in different faces and different hair colors. And, um, but I've, I've definitely seen the patterns for myself in my life um, and had to really take a deep look inward as far as where is that, uh, where does that live with inside me that has a sign on my head that says shop here for your supply. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now you've, now you've got a sign that says under new management. Under new management now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dave, hey, I just want to... Jokes need not apply. What's that? Jerks need not apply. Jerks need not apply. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you so much for, for, for sitting with me and having this conversation today. And we'll, we'll invite you back for another conversation again. Uh, Happy but, I did, but I just, uh, just want to appreciate you as a fellow traveler and uh, someone that has had a remarkable impact on my life, still is having impact and, and impacting the people that I come in contact with. And I'm service. That's, that's very, very kind of you to say, Glenn. And like I said, to me, it's an honor to be a resource person to you in the past. And I'm glad to call you friend. So I'm thrilled that you reached out for this. Thank you very, very, very much. Very much. I really appreciate it. As well. And uh, thank you everybody for listening in to today and tune in for the next episode. And um, yeah, just appreciate, appreciate the conversation today. What a rich conversation. And if you get the opportunity, please reach out to Dave and um, just check out some of the, the, uh, vehicles he's engaged with right now that are that are uh, I'm, I'm without a doubt certain they're seeding uh, betterment of humanity and uh, a way of um, just create less suffering in the world for us right. whether, it's, whether it's being caused through internal dialogue or other impacts that have have occurred within the body um, great great tools great resources great human being and again if you get a chance take a look find this book right here great place to start uh, read up on it, get other reviews, and then uh, reach out to Dave. He'll tell you even take even further. So it's available on Amazon, but also in Kindle form. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, brother, and thank you, everybody, and we'll we'll thank see you. Everybody. See you. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.